I grew up with AI because I got my PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 1984, back when the last wave of AI hype was going on. And I did my dissertation on the economics of robots. At that time, myself and m most of the people at Carnegie Mellon, most of the professors thought that robots were going to have all these capabilities by 1990, where we're only starting to see now. So at that time, it was expert systems that were supposed to take away jobs from, from experts. It didn't happen. So then, you know, about 10 years ago, people such as Eric Benjolson, Andrew McAfee, Ray Kurzweil began to push a new version of AI, uh, which is these neural networks. People like Eric Benjolson began to see, oh, this is going to this is gonna change everything. This is going to make it easy for AI to replace a lot of workers. So all kinds of uh, people began to say the same thing. And consulting firms jumped on the bandwagon for a good reason, because if they can convince people that this AI is so big, then they can provide consulting to all these companies and governments uh, on how to deal with AI. So it was just perfect for everybody. It was a way to make a whole lot of money uh, and never be held accountable. So consulting firms were saying back in 2016 that we would have $15 trillion in economic gains by 2030. Now that's a big number, 15 trillion. Right? This is a big number. Uh, I think the market for AI in 2020 was like 17 billion. So it's a little way, right? It's uh, like one 1,000 there. So there was all this hype and it's there because people benefit from it and the consulting firms benefit promote the promoters of strategy for AI. So a lot of business schools jumped on this because they could sell strategy of AI to, to, to students, right? You need to get students and what better way to get students than to tell them, here's the future of the world. You learn this and you're going to be the future king. This is a great selling point. And, uh, but unfortunately it really hasn't worked out that way. We also had winner whose name escapes me, who predicted in 2016 that uh, no reason to study radiology because in five years, they're all going to be unemployed. We're not going to have any a radiologist anymore. And the opposite is that the number of radiologists has increased because we need them because there's more MRIs and other kinds of imaging being done every year. Andrew Nig, a very famous AI expert, has, has talked about and it's, it might work in the, in the laboratory. You've got this database, uh, training data, and it works and it seems to look good. And then you apply it out in the real world and it doesn't work because the real world is slightly different than the training data. So there are some success stories in AI, but in most places, it's more about augmentation, augmenting workers, giving them information they can use to do their job better. So that's where I see AI making the difference. Difference. And I think that you will, that we'll see that and it will be, but it will be slow and gradual and it will be kind of like in, in 10 years, people will say, wow, this thing is big. But again, it's a lot of the virtual world. So when we think about a virtual world of uh, e-commerce where all you're dealing with is data on sales, uh, there's no messy real world like you have uh, in a hospital where the data is not always perfect or in self-driving vehicles where you have to interpret the physical world. Uh, but in the virtual world, yes, I think we'll continue to see AI. Uh, succeed there. There's hype in every area of technology because in startups and actually in all parts of life, because this is the way people talk. Now. People argue now. People aren't very succinct in their arguments. People tend to, they advocate a position and they're going to fight for that position. Somebody says, person A says something, person B gives a rebuttal and says, well, that's not exactly true. So then person A finds some other argument, goes off in another tangent and keeps making, you know, looking for any data that will support their argument. So uh, this is uh, unusual. I think that AI people, everybody is doing this. Everybody's trying to sell you something. And there isn't enough people who are willing to kind of say, let's have a really intelligent conversation. Let's let's talk about the, the real advantages of disadvantaged technology so that we can do better. I mentioned in consulting company, by hyping AI and other technologies, then they get all these consulting fees. Uh, they're not held accountable. They won't be held accountable 10 years from now when those forecasts don't come true or those companies don't do so well. Uh, so they benefited from that. Then there's uh, lots of universities that need to hype technologies because they need funding. They need funding. How are they going to get funding? Well, they have to say and make these big wild promises in order to get funding. They have these huge labs. They have all these researchers. They have all these PhD students. They need to get funding for those people. They need to keep those people uh, funded. Startups are the same way. They need money and VCs need money. So VCs have been the most successful at hyping technology and convincing investors uh, to give them money. So VCs have more money than they've ever had in the past, more, far more money than they ever had. And that has caused them to, to spend that money to fund startups. But when you have so much money, well, you got to spend it. So they have to spend it. And, and that's how they make money. They don't make money just from companies succeeding. They make money, they get to take a fee. So it's like 2% of all the funding they give out. They get a two, they get 2% of that. So even if those companies don't succeed, they're still going to make money. So they have this incentive to get money, bring money in, and then give it to startups. So the VCs have an incentive to hype the technology. The startups have an 
and send it to the height of technology to VCs and straight to investors, right? So these VCs make money on this, these fees, but where the big money comes in is when companies go public and the VCs are able to transfer all their investment you know, sell their investments to these to the public. And the public has done that. What we have are uh, founders uh, of these founders are all billionaires. And yet they haven't done anything close to what uh, Amazon did or Intel did or Microsoft did or all these great companies did 50 years ago, you know, 20 to 50 years ago. It's all because it's easier to hike. The media has changed a lot. So when I was growing up back, a lot of my years were spent in the days of the old media when in America, we had three dominant television states. You know, cable really, Cable didn't really tend to take off until 1980 and, and then the internet in 1990. And the, the other big thing was the, the newspapers. They, so it was the newspapers and the big three television companies dominated news. So if you wanted to get your news, you, you know, advertise, you needed to go through them. And they were very concerned about looking mainstream because all of them were, most of them were, were focused on a mainstream middle of the, the market. Well, that's all changed. What the media now, it's all online websites. I mean, there's a few that, that make money from subscriptions and thus try try to be somewhat objective. But many of these websites, they don't get subscriptions. What they do is they make money from advertisers and not just advertisers who, who write a, a sponsored advertisement or some kind of very explicit advertisement. There's something called native advertising, where right? it has a look and feel of the regular content. $57 billion last year in native advertising. So there's all these articles that you're reading that in, in which the, the website got money. From. So it's not objective because the people kind of think that, well, I, I don't want to pay for news. They don't pay for news. And right, it's the old saying, you get what you pay for. You don't pay for news. Well, then you're going to get all this hype. You're going to get all this advertisement. You know, Scientific America now, they, every year they publish emerging technology and they put 3D printing in there, even though it's been around since 1980 in the form of stereolithography and still is only a $15 billion business. You know, it's just endless how, how people will do these things and, and sell their soul to the devil. I mean, Scientific America used to be a very reputable magazine and now it does this stuff. You know, in MIT, here's the top university, engineering university in the world and it does these things. So, you know, it's, it's just become easier to do and so everybody does it. You have to ask, why is somebody writing an article about this startup talking about our greatest and they don't mention they've got $10 billion in cumulative losses. That's going to be hard to overcome. You know, Uber has $25 billion in cumulative losses, which means if Uber has to pay 4% a year for those losses, to cover those losses and in interest rate charges, it's going to have to pay $1 billion. Right? So as a reader, you have to think about it. You also have to ask when people talk about these VR, AR, metaverse, on and on and on, why aren't they telling us what, telling us what the market size is? See, when I was a young man back then, everybody talked about market size. They talk about new technology, they talk about market size because that's relevant, right? This is a key issue but it doesn't come up. They don't get mentioned. So these very key things get ignored by the media, get ignored by articles. But as an individual, you should be looking for them. You should be looking for these key types of things. You hear about a new technology and the first thing you should ask, what's going to be the first application? Right when I was a young man, by 1980 we could see that spreadsheets were. You know, by 1990 there was PowerPoint. You could see these. Things. You could see that ah, these things are beneficial. But right now people don't talk about technology. They talk about always in the future. Oh, it's going to be big. It's going to be big. Yeah, but right now, what's happening? Tell me a success story. So you should always demand a success story. These are things that the media used to do. These are things that people used to ask. Professors used to ask. Students used to ask. People don't ask these questions so much anymore. Don't get caught up in the hype about how much VC funding there is and whether whether your startups are a unicorn or a decacorn, you know, focus just on these fundamentals of finding some customers, deliver value to those customers, then find some new customers, expand. Don't worry, you know, stop hyping things.